Hello, Global Gardeners. I was thrown off a little bit there for a minute. I've got a new camera, a new computer, and it's actually a new setup. I'm used to looking off to the side as I drink my morning tea, but that's not where the camera is anymore. So nice to have you all here. It's going to be a great show. Most of us, it seems, are transitioning into a new garden season. The temperatures are cooling and we're starting to put our gardens to bed as we approach winter. And others of us, like Rick in Australia, are just beginning their seasons as they move into springtime. So that's going to be the focus of the show today. And you've heard me talk about this subject at length in recent weeks. But let's go ahead and bring in our guest. I told you last week we would have a special guest, and this is Jill McSheehy from one of my channels that I really enjoy watching. And so you can check the link to Jill's channel below. It's the Beginner Gardener Journey with Jill channel. Welcome to the show, Jill. Thank you. Excited to be here. And so it to, to, to see the name of your YouTube channel, The Beginner's Garden, mm -hmm. it implies that you are a beginner gardener, but you've been doing this now for 10 years. And one of the reasons I like your video so much is you're far from being a beginner. I, I put you into that expert category. So tell us a little bit about your journey and how you, you have moved from the beginner gardener on your journey with Jill. Well, that's very gracious. I'm not sure I would consider myself an expert. We're always learning and uh, you know how that is. But the, the reason for the name, The Beginner's Garden, is actually who I want to help. And that's beginners because 10 years ago, I was the beginner. And of course, the online landscape was so different even just 10 years ago. I had a really hard time finding basic beginning gardener information to be able to help me like the most basic questions, like what, when I plant a seed, how do I know if it's a plant or a weed? It was that kind of thing. I was Googling when I planted my potatoes, what does a potato sprout look like? So I don't pick it on accident. Right. So yeah. that was really the purpose for what I eventually started, which what started was mainly the podcast, uh, the beginner's garden podcast, but then also the YouTube channel, but the purpose is I want to be able to help beginners to find an easier on-ramp to gardening Great. than I did. And that's really been my goal for the past. I guess the podcast has been about seven years. Fantastic. And the podcast is great. Um, tell us a little bit about um, that as far as where they can find you and uh, and listen to the podcast. Because I, I listen to gardening podcasts as I'm in the garden. And I know yes. many of my viewers do as well. Yes, I started the podcast because I love podcasts. I listen to podcasts. And like you, I do it when I'm in the garden, but I'm I'm also a multitasker. So I listen when I'm cleaning or when I'm driving. And because I love them, that's what I wanted to start out with. But whatever gar whatever podcast player you listen to, most people, if they have an iPhone, they they listen on um, Apple Podcast app. And you can just search the beginner's garden. Awesome. So I encourage you all to do that. I I I think most of you regular viewers know that when I have a guest on the show, it's someone that you're going to enjoy as well. So check out Jill on the podcast and the YouTubes, of course. And so let's go ahead and get into the transitioning of this season. And so Hannah Olson says, first frost last night in the south of Sweden. I've always already had my first frost. We actually had a hard freeze this week where it got down to 25 degrees Fahrenheit. That's minus four Celsius. Have you had your first frost yet or how close do you think it is? You're in Arkansas 7B. Yes, we have not. Um, came very close the weekend before last. We got down to 39 and I had a couple of plants that made me like basil can be real particular. Um, got a little wilty, but then it perked back up. So no, we haven't had one. Depending on what where you look, our average first frost is between the 21st of October to the 1st of November. Okay. Um, it just depends on the year where, where when that falls. But so far, my my warm season crops are still hanging in there. And so what are you doing in your garden right now 
preparing for that. I, you, you've done some recent videos where you talk a little bit about that, but for the viewers today, uh, you've you've got some plants already in the ground for your fall garden, mm -hmm. but as you're looking at that garden as a whole, what are some of the primary tasks? Yeah, the, the good news about this time of year is there's not a whole lot that's super pressing. Um, one thing I did this last weekend was I planted cover crops and it, that's actually a little late for me. Usually I plant in September, but I was tied up in September and I thought, let's go ahead and get them in the ground. And the, and the cover crops that I planted are perennial in my zone. So they will hopefully, some of them actually have already sprouted that I planted two weeks ago. Hopefully they'll be able to get a good um, established space and then grow more next year. So I'm doing cover crops. And then in November, I'll be starting to accumulate fallen leaves. That's when we have a lot of uh, deciduous leaves that fall and I'll be accumulating those and then shredding them and putting them on any places I didn't have cover crops. Um, okay. Ahead of the frost though, like whenever I see that a frost might be coming, obviously I'm going to be wanting to harvest all the tomatoes that are still left and all the peppers that are still left and all the basil. But of course the cool season crops, unless we get some major drastic drop, I won't be covering them quite yet. And so when you cover, uh, are you using plastic or using row cover? What, what kind of covers do you do? Mostly a floating row cover is sufficient. I don't tend to use plastic unless usually if it's a late freeze in the spring, I may use plastic, but most of the time just a floating row cover is okay for, for 7B. Okay, great, great. And it looks like a lot of people are encountering it. John C. had the first frost in the Southeast UK last night and Wasabi Gal, who is in Minnesota, had the hard frost last night. And so it's beginning to affect a lot of us. And many of us still have plants in the ground. I still have beets in the ground. So Linzer Tort's question is, how long can I wait to pick my carrots and beets? Do you have an input on that? Yes, in my experience, longer than you think if you're a beginner. Um, I find that beets are more freeze um, susceptible, at least the tops are, than carrots. Often for my climate, carrots, I don't even, my fall carrots, I won't harvest until February. And last year we did get a really cold snap with, I think we were somewhere, I'm thinking like eight degrees Fahrenheit, but um, we didn't have any snow cover. And so there wasn't any insulation with that cold front. And so I did have some damage to the top of my roots. That's the first time that had happened. Um, but for, for the most part, I wait to harvest carrots. They can last all winter for me, but beets, I found if you get, I don't know, and you may have to do the calculations. I don't know the Celsius calculations for the international <laughs> viewers, but I found for beets probably around that 25 degrees when I see a lot of damage on those tops. Okay. And so 25 is minus four Celsius. Okay. Uh, I have a cheat You may have more, more input on that because you get colder yeah. quicker. What's your experience on that? And so uh, I've actually seen some research on this that says... Be because the root crops in particular are storing their energy. Many of the root crops we grow are biennial. So they're, mm -hmm. they're going to sit over winter like the carrots and like the beets so that the next year they can flower and seed and, and propagate for the future. Mm -hmm. And so when that cold sets in, the first frost is actually ideal because it, it tells the plant that it's, time to go into survival mode and it sends all the, the starches into the root, which sweetens the root. So waiting longer actually can produce a sweeter, better tasting beet or carrot. And if your ground isn't freezing, mm -hmm. by all means, wait. Now my ground freezes typically in December. I've, I've grown beets with the intent along with like parsnips and turnips. I like roasted root vegetables. And the idea of having a nice, fresh, roasted root vegetable side dish for Christmas is always nice. But I've gone out to harvest my carrots and beets and not been able to harvest them because the ground is frozen. So I think that's an important factor for, for you with warmer winters. You can uh, avoid the freezing ground that hits mm -hmm. some of us much sooner. But yeah, absolutely. Wait. Yeah. And, and actually use, like you're doing, use the ground as a storage. Mm -hmm. location rather than 
harvest a bushel of carrots and then try to figure out what to do with them in your house, just leave them in the ground. Yeah, I have to harvest that the whole carrot crop in the summer just because we get so hot and that they tend to get a little bit more bitter the more I leave them in the ground. But in the winter, yeah, if I need carrots, I'll just, you know, go and pick them and use them. But we we don't typically have our ground freeze. I think we got pretty close one time and I, I <laughs> put a shovel and I'm like, oh, this is what it means for gardeners that talk about their ground freezing. <laughs> that was a completely new concept for me. That's funny. So Dusty Flat says covering carrots with a foot deep of leaves, et cetera. So when you're leaving them in the ground till January, are you mulching them with some of those leaves that you're collecting? I am, but because you mentioned the tops dying back and, and you know, kind of putting the, the energy into the roots with carrots, they don't die for me. And so I'm not covering them entirely because I still want to allow them to have some, you know, from photosynthesis if necessary. So I don't completely cover them all winter long, although that may be recommended for colder areas. Not quite sure. Sure, sure. And so one of the things I I particularly like about your channel, and you talked about this with your your recent carrot video, mm -hmm. is it, it's not all the good stuff. You're not you're not sugarcoating what happens in the garden. You're showing what you're actually doing on your journey. Mm -hmm. And so talk a little bit about your experience with your carrots and germination and covering them with that flat plastic and and uh, share some of the lessons that you've learned this year. Yeah, carrots can be really challenging, especially for beginners that I've found. And the biggest challenge for them and for me was um, just germination in general, especially now in the spring, it can be challenging because carrots can seeds can take a long time to germinate. But in the fall garden, when we're planting, we're planting when it's still really hot and there's a lot of evaporation that's happening in the soil. And so the challenge a lot of times in the fall is keeping the soil moist for as long as it takes for the carrots to germinate. And there's a lot of suggestions on how to make this easier. Probably the most popular one is just to cover it with a burlap sack or even wood and I mean, I think that's a great idea, but you have to, if you're going to do that, you have to check them often because once they start germinating, they need the sunlight. And so what I've found is that putting a flat floating row cover on top of the bed after I sow the carrots and just watering on top of that and keeping that floating row cover watered, that helps because it keeps the soil moist. But if they start germinating or if they start germinating at different rates than each other, which happens often, you'll get a couple. Yeah. And then a few days later, you get a couple, couple more. The ones that germinated can still get sunlight while the other ones are still making their way. And I've found that that has been just a game changer with me as far as making sure I get a good germination rate on my carrots. This year, I did the same thing I thought that I'd always done for the last several years but I kept looking underneath the floating row, row cover and looking and there was no germination. And I thought that was really strange because I didn't have old seed and I had like mm -hmm. five different varieties. So what's the chances of them all being bad? Not, you know, it's not likely. But then when I took a step back, I was like, okay, wait a minute, where's that floating row cover and what kind of weather did we have? And the way that, that, that I did it this year and I didn't even dawn on me when I did it was I had, I planted my carrots in a raised bed and there was a, a small gap in between the lip of the raised bed and the soil level. So when I put the floating row cover on top, there was this air space. So the floating row cover wasn't directly on the ground. And because after I sowed those seeds, we had temperatures in the hundreds, even though the moisture level was consistent because I had irrigation on it, they still weren't germinating. And that's when it dawned on me, I'm like, oh my goodness, if these, some of these may have tried to germinate, but they just burned because I basically created a greenhouse in the middle of a hundred degree summer. And so when I took them off, I took the floating row covers off, the carrots started germinating, not at the greatest rate that they had before, but even looking out there this weekend, I'm going to have a, a decent harvest, not what I had had, I'd expected to have, but some of them did hang in there and I'm going to get some, some carrots. And, and that's great. And that's why I wanted to ask you about it, because now that, again, I really do consider you more on the expert side than on the beginner side. But but that's a, a key differentiation, I think, between beginner gardeners and more expert gardeners is beginner gardeners have carrot germination fail and have no idea what went wrong. And over the course of the years, 
after we've grown a crop uh, multiple times, we now have a baseline, something to compare it to. So I love your analysis. I love, and you talked about this in the video, I love uh, how you recognize the problem, tried to figure out what the problem would be. Your initial thoughts weren't necessarily correct or leading you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so you keep going back to your experience and what worked in the past and then digging, digging. I, I talk to my viewers all the time about doing detective work in yeah. the garden to really come to that conclusion. And, and I would agree with you uh, that your conclusion is, is probably completely accurate, that it was just too hot. Do you, so I'm a huge advocate of soil temperature and, yeah. and sowing with the soil temperature. And I, I think I've, I remember you mentioning that a few times. I didn't even put my tomatoes and peppers and squash in the ground this year until the third week of June, because mm -hmm. our temperatures here in Colorado were just so cold in June and I was measuring the soil temperature. So mm -hmm. uh, did you by any chance take that approach with your your fall crops in far as far as checking the soil temperature to see how warm it was before you were sowing seeds? I didn't for carrots. And the reason is because I've never had carrots have any issues with germinating when it's the, the soil temperature was too hot. Now that could have been it because I, I made the soil temperature hotter than normal, but I've, I've in the past been able to sow them in August and, and it, the soil temperature would have had to have been in the nineties, I'm sure at, yeah. at the level that I'm, I'm sowing them. But yes, I take that into account with other ones such as spinach is a big one. I've had a lot of spinach fail because I, I sowed them too early um, in the, in the fall where the temperature was too warm. Um, lettuce was the same way. That's why I don't think, think I've direct sown any lettuce in the fall this year, just because the soil temperature is way too high in Arkansas when I, when I need to get them in the ground. So I've been starting lettuce indoors, even though they are okay. fine to direct. sow when the soil temperature is right, by the time the soil temperature gets low enough, it's really too late to sow lettuce and expect a large crop just because of the day length. And that's something I had to learn by trial and error too. So yeah, I, I'm a huge advocate for soil temperature too. And, and also learning learning which ones are just very, very picky and which ones aren't so much. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that because uh, some of us have a really short season. So when I start mm -hmm. seeds indoors for a fall crop, um, I'm starting all my seeds at the same time because I'm going to put them all out at the same time. But, mm -hmm. but that's not the way you do it. So when you're starting mm -hmm. your seeds for the fall planting, why don't you share your process? Yeah, what what I want to do is, is I kind of work backwards because your your shut off may be more in tune with the cold. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I'm just making that assumption. Yeah, yeah, My shut off is more on the daylight. So what I learned was that I've got to really keep an eye on the day length because we're still warm in November and often we can be warm in December. And I say warm, I mean gardening warm, like 50s yeah. and 60s easy. Like our highs in December are in the fifties. So, um, but we drop below 10 hours of sunlight a day at the end of November, which means I'm timing more to try to get my fall crops to full maturity before the day length stops them. Because I know that the growth is going to slow and eventually stop, but I can still harvest for a long time because the cold is not going to shut them down unless we get a freak cold front or something like that until later. So if I can get them all at harvestable size earlier, then kind of like the roots in the ground using the outside as a root cellar, I can use my outdoors as a refrigerator, you know, yeah. and just go out there and harvest whenever I want to, which is one of the, the beauties of the fall garden. But because of that, to, to your original question, I do have to, to time when I'm going to put things out into the garden kind of straddling that um, we are still very hot and we're in the 90s at the end of September, which is not normal, but we were like, I've got some lettuce yeah. that's bolting and I've never had lettuce bolt in the fall. So we have to straddle the way it's really hot, but I still need to get these fall crops in the ground to, we need to get them in the ground now. So they'll have time to grow before the day length dips. So those are some of the challenges we have that, that other gardeners may not have as challenges. And, and but you're also doing sequential mm -hmm. uh, sowing. So so rather than doing everything all at once, you're doing every couple of weeks. You're sowing new seeds so that you can mm -hmm. put them out at different times as well, right? 
Yes, mostly with greens. Uh, that's really important to me to be able to have fresh greens for my salads every day. And I've actually been able to do succession sowings like that all summer long for arugula. Arugula in particular will grow throughout the summer. You just have to cut it earlier or it'll get a little bit bitter. Um, but even in the fall garden, yeah, that's what I was doing. I was I was starting a new a new set of lettuce plants every two weeks so that I could have them at different stages of growth throughout throughout the fall. And and that's worked out really well. Good. Good. Yeah, that can be very effective. And uh and and the other side to it for those who are starting their spring garden, using the succession planting is a great option. And both I, I think of it like you as shoulder season, mm -hmm. doing it either in early spring or into late fall. Uh, and again, particularly with the greens, because like many gardeners, I've made the mistake of sowing 50 lettuce seeds all at the same time. And Been then there. They, and then <laughs> exactly. And then they all come ready for harvest at the same time. And you just can't eat 50 heads of lettuce nope. before they start bolting and you've wasted all of that space. So so the succession yeah. succession sowing, I think, is a very effective method that, that a lot of people from learn, can learn from. Now, one th nice thing about Colorado is I don't have as big an insect problem as a lot of people in other areas, particularly late in the season. Alora S. has a question. I have a big problem with earwigs. Would covering my carrot seeds with something like that just allow them to eat all my seedlings because they could hide under the cover all day? So what are some of your pest concerns for your fall garden and especially with mulches? Uh, earwigs in particular, I don't have an issue with, but when she said that I was thinking about how last year I was, I was shocked with, uh, roly polies or mm -hmm. pill bugs, pill I bugs. guess <laughs> what people from yeah. Arkansas don't call or call them. Um, but what I found, which was interesting, I was just starting to incorporate more leaf mulch into my garden. And I found that when I did that, I found more issues with pill bugs and pill bugs in particular are good decomposers. So they're mm -hmm. not bad pests necessarily, but they will absolutely decimate a plant. And I probably wouldn't have believed if, if I hadn't seen it for myself. Yeah. Um, but her question was, if I cover, will it just allow them to be able to have their buffet? Yeah. I mean, it, it yeah. would, but it, as long as, it's, as long as they're there to begin with, but a lot of times if I'm covering crops like you probably do with, I don't know if you have this pest or not, but with cabbage worm or even squash vine borer, you sure. know, the point is to cover it before they get there. Yeah. And then it precludes the pest from getting into your crops. Yeah. And I completely agree. Uh, and that's the approach I take is mulching early. In fact, I, I like to have a light layer of dried grass even when I'm germinating my seeds. It's so dry here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. When I'm germinate, like carrots, when I germinate my carrot seeds, I have to water four, sometimes five times a day. Wow. And, and that's even with a very light mulch because that surface just dries out so quickly. Uh, but I think there are more pests that you can deter when you use mulch than there are those pests that will benefit from the mulch. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I lived in Oklahoma for a while. That was when I was first really kind of sort of getting serious about gardening about 30 years ago. And Oklahoma's close enough to Arkansas that I know exactly what you're talking about. I came out one day and and my little seedlings were gone. And doing the detective work, I found the pill bug or roly poly nest. And there were thousands of yeah. them in this hole in the ground and they just swarmed and devastated the crop. So, so you're right. If they're there, it's a problem. But by using a mulch, that's not necessarily going to attract them, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so Gail from Two Gals Vermont Homestead is experimenting with greens in the greenhouse in a green stock. Yeah. And has good germination so far. And I know you use your green stock and you're, you're primarily growing uh, greens in your green stock, right? Mm -hmm. I am. And last year was the first time I put my green stocks in the greenhouse for the winter. So I, I love that. Yeah, that's a good option. I, I started doing that a little bit last year. I just had last year was my first year in my greenhouse and put a green stock in it and then started measuring the temperature 
and it just got so cold here outside and inside the greenhouse that it didn't work. But this year, I think I'm going to experiment more. I've been able to keep my greenhouse much warmer this year. So yeah, keep, keep your fingers crossed with that. We'll have to wait and see what happens. And so uh, as as I look at your planning and uh, or as I look at your, your channel in particular, and we talk about garden gardening, uh, I'm already planning next year and I'm mm -hmm. already planning my spring growing. And so why don't you talk a little bit about how you look at planning your season? Because even though we're talking about transitioning to a new season, I think it's a lot more than just growing our plants as part of the transition. I'm also analyzing the past season and looking to next year's season. So what are some of the approaches you take with that? Oh, that's my favorite thing to talk about. Garden <laughs> planning, just planning in general. My, my friends know that about me. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it, it, it is, it does take an intentional look back at the season. And for me with my growing season, I mean, I'm, my growing season is probably 11 ish months, you know, if I'm really wow. stretching it. So trying to remember back to what I did in February and March or, you know, harvesting and that kind of thing. Sometimes it takes to look, looking back at pictures to remember that, but I definitely do since I I have my past garden. I'm not a first time gardener. I do look at, um, you know, how much did I plant? Was that a good amount to plant? Do I want to do different things? Do, did I can enough to last me two seasons so I can skip a season so this year? I skipped black eyed peas because I had plenty from last year. Um, so I'm definitely looking at those things. Another thing I'm looking at is pests in general. One thing that I've been able to do in the past was observe when pests are the most problematic for different mm -hmm. crops and how can I adjust the timing of the different crops based on the pests life cycle. And that helps me to be able to stay organic and yet not feed all the local insects, you know? So um, those are just a few of the reflection questions that I'll ask myself and then, you know, write down some things that I want to do be ahead of just putting pen to paper on, okay, this is what I want to grow and this is when to plant and this is how many, and this is what the successions are going to look like from season to season. It really just starts with reflecting on the last season. Now, do you try to program as much of the year as possible so that you are, you, you talked about the succession. So are you, when you begin the initial planning, Mm -hmm. looking at spring and summer and fall uh, all at the same time as part of your overall plan. Yes. And and that's something I, I teach in, in my garden planning course, Dream to Garden, because my thought is if I can do all of that, generally I'm doing it in January. If I can do all of that in January, then it makes the whole season so much easier because all I have to do is look at my calendar and say, okay, this week I'm doing this, like I'm planting this or I'm transplanting this, I'm indoor sowing this. Now with a fall garden, I will do that. But usually in July, the early part of July, I'll revisit that fall garden plan and I will just make sure, okay, do, is this what I really want to do? Do I really want to grow all of this? Or maybe I had a bumper crop of cabbage and I don't need as many or, you know, in the spring, because a lot of the, the mm -hmm. same crops you're growing in the fall, you're growing in the spring. Um, or like this year, I had a ton of celery that did amazing for Arkansas, which is kind of shocking. But then I'm like, I don't have to do as much celery in the fall. So I'll revisit it. But having a general overview of what the fall garden is going to be and already have it in, in January really does help. And it also saves money because I can buy all my seeds at once. And, and so don't get me wrong. Sometimes I'm like, Oh yeah, I need that. And so I'll, I'll oh, make yeah. a seed order in the middle of the season. But for the most part, I'm buying seeds for the entire year. And that saves on shipping because you, you know, only have to pay one shipping price. If you, if you buy from a company that charges shipping. Yeah. So I try to do as much of that in the, in the beginning of the year as possible. And, but not everybody rolls that way. That's just ha what has worked the best for me. Okay, that's good. And and I know because I, I have videos on planning and I talk about planning all the time. I think I agree with you. Totally. I think it is, it's critical to garden success because it's a journey. Terrily. Okay. 
let me know if you can all see me because it looked like there. Okay. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Are you there? I, you're good for me buffering just okay. a little bit. Okay. Yeah. For a minute there, at least on my side, we buffered and went black for a minute and you, you locked up. So looks like we're back. But anyway, for the, uh, for the planning phase, uh, I think even though journey, the journey of gardening is important, you, you do have to kind of have a destination in mind to go to that point that, that you're hoping to garden with. The, the flexibility, particularly for new gardeners, I think is important. So you've got your overall garden plan. And yeah, I do the same thing. You see something in a catalog and you've got to have that seed and you go ahead and buy it and you you go ahead and order a couple other packets just so you don't have to pay the, the, the shipping or if you're going to pay the shipping, you might as well get five packets instead of one packet. But uh, how flexible are you during the gardening season to modify your plan? I think flexibility is relative. I think that I'm pretty flexible, but I don't know if someone on the outside would feel that way. But yes, I will observe and see, um, you know, what's, how's it going. And, and a lot of times, I don't know if this is the case in your garden, Scott, but in mine, sometimes the harvest, like the way that I plan it out, I plan it out. So I know about when something's going to harvest because I have a succession planting ready to go after that. But let's say potatoes is one example. Ideally, I want to get my seed potatoes in the ground, typically early March. But if we have a whole lot of rain and we have a cooler than normal March and the soil temperature hasn't risen, then I've learned that it's really not a good thing for me to force it. I really need to wait a little bit. So if I wait even a couple of weeks, that's going to, that's going to delay the harvest by a couple of weeks, which will also delay my next succession planting or vice versa. Sometimes things harvest quicker than I had planned. And so, yeah, you have to, you have to be flexible, but to still to have an idea to know, okay, after I harvest potatoes, this is what I'm going to plant next. And then you have a little bit of flexibility. Now I have more flexibility probably on that end than you do just because yeah. my garden season is so long, but yeah, I think, I think you've got to be flexible because not everything is going to time out just like you expected it to. Good. I'm glad you said that. Uh, our June was so cold and so wet, like I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And I've been talking to a lot of my gardener friends in my garden club here about the, the results of our season. And the gardeners who planted like they always plant, typically here in our region of Colorado, is to put tomatoes and peppers in the ground the first week of June. Mm -hmm. They had terrible years with their tomatoes mm -hmm. and peppers because everything was stunted. The plants didn't do well. But for those of us who waited that extra two weeks mm -hmm. until the weather was better, I had a bumper tomato year. It was fantastic just by waiting that extra two weeks. Yeah. That can be hard to do, though, if you're starting from seed and those tomatoes are done with that little container. <laughs> That's such <Yes>. a challenge. <laughs> it is. And, and it. You know, you run out of space and the container, you, I've, I've had that happen many times where you have a, you're supposed to be transplanting it outside and you can't because of the weather. Mm -hmm. So now you've got to transplant it to a larger pot yeah. and now you run out of space and all the rest of it. So how do you approach your, now you've got the longer season and your winters mm -hmm. aren't as harsh, but the seed starting, how much, like we talked about the, the fall crops and how you start from seed indoors and then transplant. How much different or similar is that to your spring planting? Oh, like the, like the same crops that were growing in spring and in fall? Like yeah. Are you also starting, like, like even though I've got a short season, I'm direct sowing my lettuce and mm -hmm. I'm direct sowing my spinach. Are you still starting those indoors and then putting out the transplants or are you direct sowing seeds more in the spring? Oh, that's a good question. I have to think through that. Um, for, I think I do about the same. Um, I, I do, I have gotten where I really enjoy starting lettuce indoors in general, just because I feel like I have better control over, especially with the green stock, I'm going to do one lettuce in each pocket. Um, 
And then I, I, I do direct sow greens regardless. Like if they're brassica greens, they're going to germinate in cool soil or hot soil. They're, they're very adaptable. Yeah. Um, you know, carrots are going to be the same, but I guess there, there are some, I will tell you a difference. One difference is squash. And even though that's not a cool season crop, I will, I will seed start it indoors early, the first planting, because I'm wanting to get it out into my garden. I don't know if you deal with the squash vine borer, but I know when it's going to come. And so I want to get a harvest before the squash vine borer kills it. But then I'll do succession plantings to try to circumvent the borer. I'll cover, but the succession plantings I'll direct sow because the soil's the soil's warm enough to do that. So okay. yeah, I'll I'll direct sow later if if the soil temperature is an issue, and then you know indoor sow early if I know that I can't direct sow them with ideal soil temperature. Okay, nice. And you raised a very important point, and and as part of the detective work that I. I talk about often, I encourage gardeners to learn about the life cycle of their pests mm -hmm. so that they know when the adults are coming and laying the eggs and they know when the, when the larva is going to be growing in the soil and emerging and eating the plants and all those things. And so it, it, it sounds like you have also done that and you're aware mm -hmm. of the primary pests. So how have you approached that perspective, learning about your pests so that you can make those good decisions <clears throat> to deter them and decide when you're going to plant? How did you discover that? Yeah, I can give you two examples. The first one is the squash because I was, I was learning <clears throat> that it's usually the very end of June, if not the first of July, we'll get the squash vine borer will, will kill the squash plant. Now, You'll Google and you'll find stuff online that tells you how to, and, and I've done it, being able to to do all these things to prevent the squash vine borer or, or not really necessarily prevent it, but dig it out of the, the vine mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I've just found that I'm just, I'm done with messing with that. <laughs> and so instead I'm like, okay, it's going to die in early July. I'm going to be okay with that. Feed it to the chickens. Um, and then what I started doing was succession planting. And I know that the moth is active partly because of just observation. Okay. When can I plant squash again and it not die from the squash vine borer? Um, but also just observing, seeing the moth, you know, flitter around. Um, but what I found is that if I do a succession planting and I direct, so in July, then I'm covering that plant with insect netting and I'm keeping it covered until in my climate around the beginning of August, middle of August, and then I can take it off. And so far, I've not had any issues with it. Now, my assistant, Sarah, who just came to see me last week, I was telling you before we started, she's from North Carolina and she was looking at all my squash plants and zucchini and they're still thriving. And she's like, my boar, the boar in my area is active at the later part of the year. So she has found that she keeps her squash and zucchini planted at the beginning of the, of the year. And, and maybe she'll test with later cause we both have pretty long growing seasons, but I think you just pretty much have to observe and see and understand that this insects are not going to be a hundred percent active for the most, most part throughout right. the entire season. And then you just adjust from there. The second example is a, is a quicker one, but I've noticed that with beans in particular, they get hammered toward the end of the season. So I want to try to get beans started and growing in my garden earlier because they have a better chance of getting established. If I do a late planting of beans, sometimes they, I either have to cover them, which is what I did this year. I did a late plant, a late planting of fish beans. You have to cover them early or wait long or, or just completely do it in, in the beginning of the season. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Dusty Flats is saying, I tried a climbing zucchini and it was in a separate garden planted later and was missed by the squash vine borer. We have two cycles and must have missed them. So hmm. I, I often say to anyone who's sharing their garden information, write that down and document it and save it for the future so you can start following those trends. How do you track what is happening in your garden? Are you a garden journaler or uh, using any other method? Tell us about how you keep track of those type of things. Yes, I do have a garden planner and I do try to keep track of when I first spot 
the, the insect for the year. And I try to keep up with that. What I found though, is that over the years, you just, just like you, you can tell me right off the bat when you're going to plant something. The first of June, you plant tomatoes and peppers. Eventually it'll start being that you, you know, but yeah. at, at the beginning, you, you know, journal everything as far as when you, when you first start seeing things, when you stop seeing things, I mean, insects in particular disease as well. I, powdery mildew was an issue is an issue typically in the fall, but it's not in the spring. So what does that mean? As far as if I'm planting two rounds of cucumbers, then in the spring, I might be able to get away with, with a variety that that's not, doesn't have a, any powdery mildew resistance, but I like it for another reason. But in the fall, yeah. I need to make sure to, to plant one with powdery mildew resistance, you know, things like that. And all of this is higher level gardening things. And beginners, I would never want them to try to do all this stuff. This is stuff that you and I are learning years in, exactly. which makes it fun to be able to do that. And then if you're a beginner, you can think, okay, I need to start observing these things to make decisions later, but don't feel like you have to do it all the first year. A lot of the times at the beginning, you're just doing a lot of observing and learning your climate, learning your insects and, and learning those things so that you can make informed decisions later. Excellent, excellent point. And I, I completely agree. In the beginning, you're going to be underwater for about three or four or five years as you're trying to just put all the pieces together. But as you move to the new levels, and, and I talk about establishing new thresholds of knowledge and thresholds of experience because you're able to take what you've learned and move to the next step. I actually observed something new this year after all these decades of gardening. I'm still learning in the garden all the time. Mm -hmm. I I get powdery mildew on a regular basis late in the season, like most people do, but I didn't get it this year. And I think I'm going to have to do some more research on this, but I think it's because my plants were in the ground two to three weeks later than normal, which means they were younger when it came to the point, more more robust, stronger, when it came to the time of year that I would normally get the powdery mildew. And so stronger plants are more resistant to diseases. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm now observing and beginning to conjecture in my garden that if I want to avoid some of those potential diseases in the future, I don't have many but the planting time and the strength of the plant actually might play a factor in it. So yeah, even us old experienced gardeners can observe and maybe come up with new ideas for what had happened. And sometimes it takes something that you wouldn't have chosen, which is having to plant everything later, because of course, why would we want to plant anything later? We're excited to plant things for our That's garden. Right. That's how I felt last year when we had, a, a longer drought than I had ever seen as a gardener. And then super high temperatures, consistent, very, very, very high, more than I'd ever seen as a gardener. And I thought, you know what, I guess with this experience, I'm going to learn which plants are the most resilient. <laughs> you know, So even when things like that come that you would never have chosen, you still have things you can learn. Absolutely. So Sherry's wondering, do you have deer to deal with? They're having rutting season and the beasties are dancing in the moonlight and snacking on anything. I actually, even though I've got my fruit trees covered with netting, the deer this last week were eating the tips that were poking through the netting. So do you have the big animal problems like deer? We have a little family we see quite often actually outside. Um, I have a, a fence. We have a fence surrounding our main garden space and it's it's an electric fence and it's only about three feet tall, which all the experts will say you need seven feet because they could jump that. But I've never had deer jump that fence. And I think it's because we also have a couple of trees inside the garden space. And then we also have trellises everywhere. And deer, from what I understand, don't have good depth perception. So if they right. can't perceive a, a flat landing place, they're not going to. Um, we also have a dog that her, she stays outside and her run is right next to the garden, although she's kind of old and I'm not sure how much she deters them, but maybe just her presence helps, but sure. I've never had them get into the garden yet. And I think that that's the reason why. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, the, the fence information is, is accurate based on some of the, the research I've done and, uh, at my last house, we had a family of deer that lived in the the oak 
scrub oak that was right next to the garden. And my fences were only three feet tall. And just on the other side of the fence were the raised beds and the trellises. And I never had the deer cross that three foot fence to get into the garden for, mm -hmm. for that reason. They just don't like to jump and land if they're going to break a foot, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And so definitely an, an interesting perspective. Again, it's like the insect pests. You learn about whatever the pest is in your garden and it does help deal with it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Jay Dixon, one of my fantastic moderators, saying every year I like to adopt a few local newbie gardeners to help support them through those confusing first years. Many new gardeners quit and I want to help prevent that. So one of the reasons I am in my local gardening club is, is for that same reason. Uh, you've, you've got lots of information. Again, you're an expert gardener, believe that, and it will be true. <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, You've got your channel, you've got your podcast, you've got your course, you've got a lot of information to help the beginner gardener, since the name of your course. Uh, are you active or do you, what do you, what might you do to help promote those new gardeners that might live in your area in Arkansas? Yeah, that's an area that I've, I've actually been wanting to get more into. Um, quite frankly, with the size of my garden and the amount of preserving that I do there just hasn't been a lot of time for me to, to do extra. One year I did participate in a community garden and it was really hard for me to make time to do both that and my garden. Um, I do, you know, all as many friends as I have and people at church, I try to talk to as much as I can. And if they want to do, if they're like, I just need you to help me plan my garden. I'm like, I'm there. I will make time for you. Um, but that is, I think that is, is so needed in general. And one, one reason I think that, that I will be switching some things that I do in my garden next year, as far as scope and size is I want to be available to do that because while what you and I do, Scott, are, is so beneficial to be able to get so much information, I just don't think anything can compare to that shoulder to shoulder. Here's how you do this in our climate. And that's exactly. one reason I love to talk to, to my friends because I can say, I don't have to say why you don't plant spinach until a certain amount of time. You know, you don't plant spinach in July, you know, just, just don't. <laughs> and then they'll follow That's my right. instruction. It's, and then, you know, they, we can understand each other's climate better. Um, so I, I hope more and more people will, will do that just because I think it's so needed. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, I, I actually learn, I, so I, I managed a school garden for a number of years very large garden with a, a large number of students. And I learned more in that program because the students, preteens asking questions about gardening really required me to learn a lot more about gardening. Mm -hmm. And and I see that with, with my much older gardener pals now who ask questions that you and I now have learned we don't even think about. They're just yeah. second nature, but they're asking basic questions. Mm -hmm. And I think it benefits both sides. I think it benefits not only the experienced gardener helping out the young gardener, but it really does help the experienced gardener recognize that we might have holes in our knowledge that, that we need to learn more from. So, yeah. uh, so I encourage you to do that because I, I think it will help you become even a better gardener and a better educator because you'll you'll be able to see some of those things that can benefit you. And so for those of you that might be joining us just now, I'm talking with Jill from the Beginner's Garden Journey with Jill channel. And we'll keep going here until the, the show is over. Thank you, Jay, for putting that link. And I also have a link to Jill's channel in the description below. So by all means, check that out. And so you, you mentioned a few minutes ago, and I wanted to be sure and talk about preserving mm -hmm. our harvests. And, and I have preservation videos of all types. And I, I do freeze drying and dehydrating and fermenting and pickling and jelly making. And if it's, if it's a possible way to preserve, I'm preserving. I've got a couple bags of tomatoes in my freezer right now for Me when too. I, when I make sauce here in a little bit. So yeah, let's talk about that for, for a bit and what some of your favorite methods. I think one of the things that, that deters many gardeners from 
preserving is they think it's overwhelming and they're not sure how to start. And they're not sure what to do. And it's not that difficult. What are, right. what are some of the things that you, you would tell, particularly a beginner gardener, but even most experienced gardeners, what you, how you approach the preserving of your harvest? I think for the beginner, I would just encourage you that you can do it because I started preserving my first year. I, I grew up like in, in the periphery watching my mom can tomatoes, but I don't personally like tomatoes and it made the house smell like tomatoes and I couldn't stand it. So I didn't watch her. She didn't teach me. So I had to learn myself. And that was even before there was a lot of stuff on YouTube. I went and got from a local used bookstore a ball blue book of canning, a ball book of canning. And I just read it and I followed it. And now I have a more updated version of it, which I think everyone, if you want to preserve, you just need to have that. It's got your staple recipes. It may not be the most, you know, creative ones. There's other books for that, but just getting the ball blue book, I think is a great way to start. And it teaches you, I mean, I started pressure canning my first year. And to me, once you learn how to pressure can, it's not hard to me, I prefer doing it in many cases. I mean, water baths fine too. Um, but it's that the thought of you having to learn it is probably going to be more overwhelming than actually learning it. Yeah. And, and so, uh, Lindsay Tort has a question. Tell me more about bags of tomatoes in the freezer. I think most people that that's what I would suggest as a, a way to begin preserving. We're used to the freezer. We put a lot of our food in the freezer, and many things that we have in our garden are ideal for freezing. We, mm-hmm. the, the thing about tomatoes, now the reason I've got mm-hmm. my tomatoes in the freezer right now is because I'm going to make sauce. Many of the things we put in the freezer, if you thaw them out, they get mushy and they lose their consistency. And so we, we do focus. So why, why do you have your tomatoes in the freezer? I have bags of tomatoes in the freezer because we had a stellar tomato year. We, I plan my vacation every year to be between the spring harvest and the summer harvest so that I don't have a whole lot that I have to have whoever's, you know, watching over my house do. But this year our tomatoes came on early. And so my nephew who came and harvested, I just told him to throw those tomatoes in freezer bags whole And then when I get to it, I'll do what you did. I'll take them out. When you defrost them, you don't have to blanch because they'll automatically, the the peels will slip off. It's, it's actually pretty easy, but I, I don't love the texture that way. Personally, I know to me, it's an easy way to, to do it. Like you said, if you're a beginner and you only have a couple of tomato plants, you're not going to have enough tomatoes to do a canner load if you only have a few plants. So it's a good way to put them up until you have enough for a canner load. Um, I prefer though to can mine fresh, but if in a pinch, you know, I'll put them in the freezer and then I can have them for later. Okay. So you're actually planning to can uh, the tomatoes that you have in the freezer right now. I'm, I may, um, I, well, like I said, we had a bumper crop this year, tomatoes, and I, I may have enough tomatoes to last for two years. So I, I okay. haven't quite decided what I'm going to do with the ones in the freezer. I may end up just experimenting with something. I'm not okay. sure. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's that, that actually sounds a lot of fun. Um, and so much of the garden that I plan in advance, it ties into what you just talked about when I have an excess of harvest and they're dehydrated or they're frozen or, you know, obviously I have enough to last for the next year. I might not plant that same plant in the next season. Yeah. And then the inverse of that, when I want to have uh, a, a big crop, like the raspberries, I grow raspberries to make raspberry jam. And I, you know, have all the various other plants, many of them for a specific preservation purpose. So as you're planning out your garden, you're, you're doing mostly fresh eating with you and your family. Um, you, you had the recent video that I was saying about your green beans. Uh, and I, I love finding those mid-size canning jars. I hadn't I ever heard yeah. that as well. Um, so anyway, if you know, if you want to know what we're talking about, check out Jill's channel and you can see that the video she did with the canning. Oh, you froze beans. up on me. Okay. Oh, I, there you are. Yeah, you froze up on me for a little bit too. Um, so, but anyway, as far as the planning, 
Mm -hmm. for the purpose of preservation, how much of that do you do? Uh, that's a huge part. Um, that's the reason why I started gardening in the first place was to be able, because I was, I was a work outside the home mom and I wanted to become a stay at home mom. And my whole goal for my first garden 10 years ago was to be able to grow food, to make it where our grocery bill wasn't as high. And so, because that was my purpose, my purpose wasn't because it was a hobby or just that I wanted something else to do. My purpose was to grow food for our family preservation has always been a huge part of it. It's how much can we grow so that I can grow a year's worth of as much as I can. And so when I go into a season, I'm wanting to grow a year's worth of green beans, a year's worth of tomato products, a okay. year's worth of onions, you know, and, and every year as a beginner, my goal was tomatoes and green beans and blueberries. But Every year I've been like, okay, how much closer can I get to a year's worth of onions where, where I'm really close now, if they would store a little bit longer, I would have plenty, but that's yeah. another issue. But, um, the goal is to be able to grow enough, to be able to preserve in whatever way I decide to preserve it so that we, we do not buy much produce at all year round because of nice. the garden. Nice. And so Gail is wondering, how you preserve celery. Now, I I don't grow celery because it's just so dry and it's just too hard to grow celery for me. Um, but you've already mentioned that you do grow celery. So how do you preserve celery specifically? What I've been doing the past few years is freezing it. So I'll, I'll uh, slice it and then I'll throw it on a cookie sheet pan or a, like a baking sheet, put it in the, the freezer, let it freeze. That's called flash freezing. Mm -hmm. And then I'll take it out and then I'll put it in Ziploc bags. This year I experimented with dehydrating. I've never done that before. I assume it'll be fine, but I can't really speak to that because I haven't used it yet. But the the freezing is the way that I do it. And that's that's for use in soups and things like that. That's not your dipping in peanut butter or ranch dressing type celery after you defrost it. It's gonna lose its texture. It's it's prime, it's um exclusively for cooking. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh and uh, much of what I do, because the kids are gone and the grandkids are gone, so I don't need to store as much food. So I will go ahead and use whatever from the garden and then make it into something. So like John C says, I made a lot of celery into celery soup and then froze the soup. And I do a lot of that as well, where I'm actually making the meal or making the soup or making the chili or making whatever it happens to be and then freezing that. Are, are you doing much of that or do you like to do the individual ingredients, freeze or dehydrate and then pull those out to add to your recipe in the future? I mostly do individual ingredients. Um, the only thing that I do that might be considered a meal is spaghetti sauce. And then that okay. just goes, you know, I don't make the spaghetti sauce with tomato sauce and seasonings. I just do spaghetti sauce, but the rest of it, I mostly just do individual ingredients. Okay. And yeah, I do, I have all of my herbs and, uh, mm -hmm. the, the herbs, of course, I, grow specifically so I can dry them and put them in little jars in the pantry so that I can season yep. every year. And I, I know you've got videos on your herbs and, and how you do that. Um, and so my, my basil just recently went to seed and you just did a video talking about as you're transitioning your garden, you pulled out all your basil plants. And so- Not all of them. Well, the, the ones that you showed in the video in that mm -hmm. particular bed that you were replanting. Right. And, and so give us, uh, as, as a mother to the new gardeners who have difficulty pulling their plants out of the ground during the time of year when you want to be transitioning to other plants, how did you overcome that, that pain of a plant that might be alive, but yet you knew you had to pull it from the ground? I think it took actually doing it and realize I've never regretted it. Like there's never been a plant that I've taken out that I have gone back and said, oh, I wish I hadn't have done that. And most of it is also a strategic, what am I going to pull? Is there any hope? For example, um, 
my husband was wanting me to take down some of our, my tomato plants because we're taking down the deck. It's a whole other, it's a project we're doing, but I'm, I'm like, well, I don't want to take those down because I want to keep them till frost. But then I looked at the plants and I'm like, they're flowering, but the only tomato I have is about this little and it's green. And we're two weeks from our average first frost date. It's not going to even get to where it'll ever ripen anyway. Yeah. So I took it out or a cu cucumber plant that's not looking great. And I don't know when the last time I saw an actual fruit was, there's no reason for it to stay. So, and then maybe I have right now, I have four jalapeno plants what, and two of them are like huge. Like, well, if I take one out, I'm not going to miss it. Right. Cause I already have one. And so with the basil, it was the same way. I was like, okay, I have other basil that I, that I can harvest from if I need to, these are well into seed. The, the bees have gotten plenty they're going to be okay. Um, so I think kind of taking a big picture stand, but also, like I said, I've, I've never regretted taking something out. It just, it makes it so much cleaner. And then you have garden space to do something new and fresh. And I think Absolutely. once you do that, then you don't ever go, then you, you don't have as much of a hurdle to overcome. Absolutely. And, and I've seen some of the comments that, uh, uh like socks in the garden is saying, I still cannot do that. Uh, but it really does, it, you know, I, I, I try to help gardeners move to the next level. And that is one of those things, like you said, once you do it, you realize it, it's okay. And, yeah. and, and you're glad that you did it and wonder why you never did it as early as you should have done it in the past. And you don't have to do all or nothing, you know, like I took out some of my tomato plants, but some I left. So it's not like you have to, yeah. you could leave one and take one out, you know, dip your toe into the water. <laughs> There you go. Good suggestion. Good suggestion. Um, Dylan Gray's wondering, a lot of my peppers are full size, but are slow or not turning red. Been on the vine for a long time. I won't get a frost for a while. Should I harvest or wait? And so this is one of those things and kind of like exactly like you were just talking about. You don't have to harvest everything at the same time. And particularly with peppers, you can eat them when they're green. You don't have to wait till they're, they're fully red. Many peppers, once you've passed the blush point where they started to turn color, will continue to change color as you as you harvest and let them sit on the counter or in your bowl. Uh, but what are your thoughts about the, you know, we'll talk peppers, but any other plant that comes to mind as well. When it gets close to that harvest time, the frost might be coming. They're not changing color. How do you approach the harvest in that respect. Well, he said that he's not going to get a frost for a while. I would, I would leave them if you want them to be red, because what I've found is that the closer you get to the end of the season and the frost, the quicker the plant's going to ripen it up. Because remember that the plant's job is it wants to develop seed and those seeds are not going to be viable until the fruit is fully mature. And if you're talking about a, a, a pepper that will eventually turn red, it, the fully mature state's going to be red. So that's why I will harvest my green peppers early in the season because they're so slow to mature. And then if I harvest them, then the plant will continue to pump out production. Whereas if you leave them on the, on the plant, then the plant's going to throw its energy into ripening it. So I'll harvest green peppers early, but then leave the other ones when I'm done with green peppers to ripen. And then they'll ripen quicker toward the end of the season. But if you see a frost coming, then at that point, you just harvest it all. And then, then you leave them and if some of them will turn red, some won't, then, I mean, you haven't really lost anything at that point. So I would, I would leave them. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and that's what I did in my garden with our first frost last week, I waited and waited and waited and then harvested jalapenos in particular all the day before the frost was forecast. And some of those green jalapenos are turning red they're going to look beautiful when I pickle them this week. So Aww. I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Uh, yeah. So ten Tennessee Nana says, I figure using the plants for chop and drop, they're still being used and doing good in the garden. And so I do chop and drop. And for those of you that don't know, chop and drop is basically um, with leaves, with flowers, with stalks. When the plant is done, you just chop it into little pieces and let it drop right where it was as a mulch in the garden. So how much chop and drop do you do when you're cleaning up your garden? I do a lot. If as long as as long as the plant doesn't have a huge amount of disease or pest infestation, I will do that. Because in my opinion, it's just 
in place compost. It's going, it's going to feed the microbial life in the soil as it breaks down. A great thing to do in, in the fall too, because you're also covering the soil to help prevent erosion during the winter time. Um, I crops very, very beneficial. Absolutely. And, and so, um, the, tell us a little bit about your garden, cause I'll be asking you a few questions. So you're trying to grow enough for your family for a year. And so share with us how big your family is that you're saving for and how many beds you're growing in to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, it's my husband and I, and then a 17 year old son and a 13 year old daughter. And I keep, I keep expanding my garden space every year. So I can't, I don't even know for sure what the garden space is, but our big garden space, what I would consider my production garden, which is a combination of in-ground garden and about 20 raised beds, maybe, okay. um, it's probably about 2,500 to 300 or 3000 square feet in total. And then I also have a kitchen garden outside my patio, which is a, a U-shaped elevated raised bed. I also have another uh, birdies raised bed. Um, I have four green stock planters. So I, I have a, a lot of garden space, I would say, considering that I'm, I do it, you know, alone. So that's about what the, the scope of my space is. And so how did you get to this point? Because 10 years ago, you did not have 3,000 square feet of garden mm -hmm. space. So how did you begin and how have you progressed? Like, like many of us, we're always expanding our garden. So how, mm -hmm. did you, how did you come up with a plan for how much you were going to expand each year as you were learning more? I laugh because... Um... <clears throat> because I've just ended up just adding more <laughs> every year. I'm like, Oh, I want to grow more of this and more of that. Um, the garden space, the first year, the in-ground garden space was about maybe 40% or maybe even 30% what it is now all in-ground space. My husband had actually built two raised beds for back before I ever wanted to garden. And so we still, I still had that. What I realized though, was that and I had my soil tested, so I knew what my soil deficiencies were. But besides the soil test and observation, I observed that the crops in my raised beds did better than the ones in the ground. So when I was expanding, I did a lot of expanding to add more raised beds. So eventually I took the two raised beds and we built some more also, and I put them all in the same garden space each year. Um, and then at some point, I, a few years ago, I was like, okay, I've, I'm maxed out. I, I don't have enough energy myself to be able to maintain this. And it's plenty, you know, it's plenty for us. But I think when I do expand each year, it's usually adding raised beds to what used to be a ground bed, just because I get so much more production out of it. And how much, if any, container growing do you do? Are you using grow bags or buckets or pots to help supplement that? Of course, I have the four green stocks, but, and I do have grow bags. I use those more as a overflow, or if I have any particular reason I want to use a grow bag, for for example, I'll plant a couple of early tomatoes in grow bags in my greenhouse so that I can get an early start on those. Right now I've got four or five grow bags of potatoes because I want to be able to put them in my greenhouse when it gets too cold for them. So I'll use the grow bags more strategically. And then I have a, a lot of perennial herbs in containers. But as far as um, container growing vegetables in general, I, I don't do as much of that as a lot of people do. I, I really like the production I get from my raised beds. Plus, container growing has a lot of potential, but it also requires a lot more babysitting as far as fertility and water. And to me, there it's more hands-off in general with raised beds for, for those reasons. Absolutely. Yeah. Some of us, uh, you know, with, with short growing seasons have to re resort to grow bags because we can move them in and out of the greenhouse and we can put them in the sheltered areas. And so with a short growing season, I, I do advocate experimenting with grow bags because it can expand and potatoes. I've, I've got a couple of videos on potatoes and growing in grow bags. I think it can make a big difference, but I'm like you, I, with whether it's a grow bag, a pot, 
or in ground or raised bed, I get the best results from the raised beds. And so that tends to be what I, what I focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, Maura D is wondering about the chop and drop. I, I have daikon radishes as one of my cover crops and because I've got really dense soil and that helps break apart the soil. So uh, do you leave the roots in the ground over winter or do you pull them and include the roots in the chop and drop? So how do you approach that if you're growing uh, the, the roots that you're leaving in the ground? I don't know that I've ever grown daikon radish as a cover crop. Um, if, if I have, it's been part of a mix. <clears throat> and I don't know that, that any one way would be any better than the other. I probably would leave it and then let it decompose into the ground. And you, you've you got the way, you know, the so food for the soil microbes. And then you've, you've got that channel that it's help, helping to aerate the soil. Um, I guess you'd get that channel if you took it out too. But I don't know. What do you think, Scott? Well, and so... Uh, I've actually modified. I used to pull the roots. I used to think of it as great biomass to add to the compost pile. Mm -hmm. And so I would leave the leaves on the ground, but I would actually put the roots into the compost pile. Mm -hmm. And particularly this last year, early in my season, when the soil was just, we, we talked earlier that your soil doesn't freeze and my soil does freeze. So mm -hmm. when the the soil begins to thaw in spring and I can begin working in the soil, I discovered a lot of earthworms around the roots that I had left in the ground. Mm -hmm. And so promoting the soil life, promoting the earthworms, I now leave the, the roots in to break down, to decompose, to, to be food for the soil life rather than become food for the, the compost life. Yeah. And, and it's working. And, and so there, there's a question from Sandy wondering how you manage all of the work to preserve your harvest. I find it overwhelming with just a small garden and two productive apple trees. And it's not just the work to, to preserve your harvest, but you're also doing an awful lot of other things in your life with your family and YouTube channel and the, the podcast and everything else you do. So how do you allot your gardening time and your preserving time to fit in with the rest of your life? Oh man. If you ask my husband or my best friend, you can, they'll tell you I'm, I'm not the best person to be around in July because <laughs> that is preserving season for me primarily with tomatoes. Cause that's when our tomatoes come to harvest. One thing that I found has helped me is in kind of going back to knowing your season and knowing, you know, when things are kind of come to harvest, I, I've started to plan the production crop harvest that I know I'm going to preserve in a way where it's not coming on all at once. Now, I know for some climates, that's not possible. Everything mm -hmm. comes in at September regardless, and you're just busy for September. Like your September is my July. But I've found that um, if I want to preserve pickles, then I can get cucumbers to come to harvest more so in June, same way with beets. But for uh, tomatoes or July, that that's what they're going to be for my climate regardless. But then I'll also plan for green beans to be more of a September harvest and September um, uh, preserving. And that's another reason I don't, when I do plant corn and I plant it for, for preserving, I'll plant a late planting of corn. So it's not ready till September either or, or okay. August. So I have the flexibility to do that though, because of my long growing season, but I've started to time my plantings, not just to try to circumvent pests, but also to try to make it where not everything's coming to harvest all at once. And, and that takes a little bit of juggling, but that seems, that seems to make it where I'm not losing my sanity when everything's coming to harvest at the same time. That is a fantastic idea. <laughs> I, and, and I, I hope everyone listened well to that because I think that is is something again that all gardeners do until they discover that they can modify the garden however they want to. Mm -hmm. Is everyone thinks you've got to put the garden in all at the same time and then everything yeah. is ready for harvest all at the same time and it becomes overwhelming all at the same time. Yeah. And and you can modify it to fit your schedule, especially when you have a busy schedule and you're you're working for the preserving. Mm -hmm. I also encourage the varieties, not only varieties of plants that work best in your area, but you can choose the varieties of the same plant, same type of plant 
that will harvest at different times as well. So right. I grow a lot of cherry tomatoes that will be the first ones to produce. Those are the first ones that I'm using to, you know, in, in my dinners. And then I've got the late ripening tomatoes that are going to be used for canning or freezing or dehydrating or whatever I use them for. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't think we have to think about uh, all at once, all at the same time. And so you, you talked about choosing when you're growing those types of crops. Do you do that as well, where you are growing different varieties that maybe you sow at the same time, but also with a different harvest time? I think I do that more with the crops that I eat fresh. For okay. example, if I, one, one time, and I just had to do this. So if you're a beginner, you may have to do this too. Um, I wrote out the different varieties of lettuce that I was going to grow. And I specifically wrote, okay, this variety is this many days to maturity. And I listed them in order. And there was a quite a big difference. If you're talking about greens, you're talking about 30 days to maturity. If you're talking about a romaine lettuce, you're talking about 60 days to maturity and everything in between. But by doing that, I was able to, to decide, okay, I'm planting them all at once, but because they're staggered days to maturity, I'm going to get a staggered harvest that way. Um, and I think you can do that too with, with things that you preserve as well so that you're not having to preserve everything all at once if you have a huge garden. But understand that a lot of things that you preserve, you, you're going to have to have a, a, a lot of volume to be able to get enough for a canner load of certain yeah. things, especially like dry beans and black eyed peas and that kind of thing. Green beans are, you know, you can get a lot out of a little bit with green beans, but um, yeah, I've, I've found that to be one of those things that you just don't think about. Corn is another one. If you want to have a season long full of corn, you know, you can get corn and you can even get some seed catalogs sell them this way where they'll sell you three different varieties that have three different days to maturity so that you can get a longer harvest of corn. So yeah, I think that's a, a great idea that we can all incorporate more. Good, good. Uh, Colorado Bird Nerd, thank you for that super chat. Wow, what a delightful guest. I completely agree. As always learned so much. Thank you. And so uh, that's the one nice thing about this, this group. Greg Daner as well. Yes, agreed. Terrific guest. Thank you both. And thank you, Greg, for that super chat. And I, I'm not sure how much you're able to follow along with the the questions along the side and the discussion, but but I am enjoying having you on today. And I can tell the viewers are enjoying the time as well. So if you are just joining us, this is Jill from the Beginner's Garden Journey with Jill on YouTube, and we're talking gardening. What a surprise. Monday morning on the Gardener Scott Show to actually be talking about gardening. This this is one of the things that, that we do, and I, I talked with you a little bit before the show every Monday, and we have people from all over the world that are watching right now, which is absolutely fantastic. And so for those of us who are already hitting freezing temperatures and finishing our garden, your your 7B zone gives you a much longer season. And you talked a little bit about the light levels. I think that's the biggest limitation with winter gardening is mm. the plants just slow down until yeah. they, they perk back up again. How much do you plan ahead for that wake up cycle? Mm. Uh, I, I know when I was growing at, at the, the school garden, we had a big greenhouse and I would start plants in January, knowing mm -hmm. nothing was going to happen. They would germinate and get little plants, but I was trying to get that, that step up so that as soon as the days are long enough, those plants know the days are long enough and they'll start growing. Do you do that? How much do you anticipate that light change in early spring? A lot, especially in my my plants that I'm able to put into the greenhouse, the lettuces and the greens. Last year we had a hiccup, which you may or may not have heard on the podcast, but we had a really low, uh, I think it was right around Christmas and it was going to be very low, like zero degrees. And then I'd plugged in the heater in the greenhouse. I don't heat my greenhouse typically very much, but I, I really felt like, okay, we're getting down to zero that even the lettuce and the greens are going to have a hard time with that. Um, so I had the heater plugged up and then we had a power failure for like 20 hours 
And that was when I learned that, you know, even the hardiest of greens have trouble. But um, all that to say, that was a little tangent to say, I found that the light levels are a huge, a huge issue with, or in a good issue with plants that I have that have been able to overwinter in the greenhouse because mm -hmm. I can plan on them to really start growing incrementally, kind of like they slow down incrementally in the fall and, and being able to take back off. And it's pretty amazing what I've been able to get as a harvest at a time where most of the time people are not harvesting in February, March the time, you know, when you're starting to run out of your preserved stuff and then being able to have a harvest that early spinach overwinters really well here. Yeah. So just watching that and observing it, I definitely plan for that. I know that that growth is going to accelerate come January 20, 28th, I think somewhere like that is when <laughs> we go above 11 hours. Nice. Nice. And, and so, hours. and there's another shout out to the concept of keeping track of the conditions for your individual garden because you can highlight exactly when that light is going to change and the hours which will I, be different for you because oh, you're yeah. at a higher latitude than I you know so your your accelerating will will be later than mine absolutely and so it's very important for all of us to recognize those those differences I think one of the limitation another reason why I like your channels because it is it is very broad based there are a lot of wonderful gardening YouTube channels, but they're focused on their own region and their region is different than yours and it's different mm -hmm. than mine. And while we might have some commonality, if they tell me what I can do in September, it doesn't match at all with what I can really do in September. Yes. And so we all do need to keep track of all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been hardening off outside for more than 30 years. This last year was the first year I actually started hardening off in the greenhouse. And so how do you approach your hardening off? I'm guessing you've got more plants than you've got space in your greenhouse. So, uh, how, or, or do, are you able to do everything in the greenhouse? I have a large greenhouse. Um, I, it's, I say large, large enough to handle where I harden everything off in the greenhouse okay. for spring but I can't do that for my fall planting because it's a hot house. And so I can't harden off in, in the fall um, out there. And so I would say that the a bigger a big thing with hardening off without the greenhouse is it honestly did, I'm thinking you you gotta I've I've learned that I have to not only take into account full sun, but I also have to take into account what time of day because the the plants are going to have a harder time when you first put them out. If you're mm -hmm. putting them out at noon or one, than they will in the morning or in the late afternoon. So taking consideration that the the track of the sun, but then also the wind is a big deal too. If there's if there's if it's wind if it's if it's just slightly breezy, that's actually good. But if it's too windy, then they either need to be sheltered or I probably don't need to take them out that day. So those are the, those are the things I consider with outside. I think that, that get overlooked in the har hardening off process. Yeah, absolutely. And the, you know, for those of us that have hardened off outside most of our gardening careers, that's how I begin hardening off is in the morning with mm -hmm. the, the cooler temperature, but the low light levels from the sun. I've made that mistake in years past where I had a meeting in the morning or had to do something and couldn't put the plants out. And then I get home in the heat of the day and think, oh, I've got to harden off the plants. Mm -hmm. And then I stick the plants outside for my normal two hours of hardening off and they're fried Yeah. in, in just one day. The same plants that might have already been out for three days early in the day that, that were fine. And then I brought them in and putting those same plants during the harsh sun is enough to kill them. So that is a very important factor. And, yeah. and the wind as well, too much wind. I live in a very windy region and I've had that problem as well, where you forget about the plants and come back and they're snapped off because of the sun and the wind. So those are just lessons that you have to learn as part of our journey of gardening and, uh, and maybe get to the point of, of having a greenhouse. I, I've gardened for more than 30 years before I was finally able to, to get that greenhouse and, and, makes and a difference. A big, it really does make mm -hmm. a big difference. 
Socks in the Garden, thank you for that contribution. Thank you so much for all you both do and for the info you share to help us all be better gardeners. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. And uh, the, the channels out there, and I encourage gardeners to, to check out as many different sources as they can. You know, I, I have no doubt you have very loyal fans and I have very loyal fans and viewers that are part of our own respective communities. But I think it's important to, to see how other people garden, even mm -hmm. if it's not Zone 5B Arkansas or, or Zone 7B Arkansas or Zone 5B Colorado. And so I try to devote a regular time to watch other videos and listen to podcasts and read blogs. Uh, do you have that as part of your normal gardening activities where you are watching others? I do. I, I do think it's helpful. Um, I do think that sometimes beginners, especially, <clears throat> they will find, you know, podcasts or YouTube channels. Thank you. Um, that they, that they will just assume because this gardener does it this way, then this is how they need to do it. And I think what you're saying is that the more that you, you start learning your climate, the more you can almost filter through that. So if I'm watching a gardener, you know, in, you know, Washington or California or Colorado, then, then I can learn, but I can be like, okay, but their climate is a little different than mine. And this is why they're doing this, even if they don't say it. Um, so I think it's important for beginners to know where's the person gardening from and how is it differing from what you're, where you're gardening? Cause I'll find that I'll find some channels helpful, even if they don't garden the same way I do, maybe they're not organic or maybe they're all in the ground, but because they have a similar climate than mine, I learned things that I would never have learned because they have a really hot summer and I didn't realize this was a problem. Oh yeah. I figured out that I had root knot nematodes on my okra by doing that. I, I just thought the okra was dying, you know, at the end of the season. And then it was, it took a Southern gardener for me to realize that that was what was going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a good point. I, I, I like, and I, and I, this is one of the approaches I take. If I'm trying to learn more about a particular topic, I'll watch four or five or six mm -hmm. videos on that topic from different YouTubers and then do exactly what you're talking about. Identify what's different between the videos and why it's different and how I can figure out what that difference means to me in my garden. Mm -hmm. And and again, that's another one of those things that can help take you up to another level as far as, as how you're you're going to garden. Uh, yeah, it talk teaches you to think for, think for yourself. And I think that's what's going to serve you in your garden more than just a, res a recipe. Exactly. It, we we as gardeners are, are little puppies who have to follow along for the first couple of years. But at yeah. some point, you can be the big dog and make the decisions yourself. Yeah. So so you're, Ed, you're an organic gardener and I'm an organic gardener. And uh, the the approach to organic gardening. Uh, let's go ahead and end with your thoughts on why you are an organic gardener and how that influences the approaches you take. I think it started out with doing it for a health, for health reasons, you know, just not wanting the produce that I brought to my family to have, you know, the pesticides and all of that. But I, it's evolved more since I've been a gardener as I, I've, I've been able to see the role that each part plays in the ecosystem. The, you know, there's nothing like watching a ladybug larva chomp on an aphid. I mean, it's just seeing nature at that is work. Very cool. And if you take, if you take that out of the ecosystem, then it's, it's causing disruption for the whole thing. And so I think for me, an organic gardener is also protecting the beneficial insects. You know, I have honeybees, but also have native bees. And I want to do everything I can to protect that from, you know, not just from my local garden, but also ecologically for the bigger picture. I think the more of us that really do care about those things, I think the better it's going to be for our planet. And I'm, you know, I'm not a doomsdayer at all, but I am concerned about the future of our food system. And the more people we can educate and so that way, if they know how to grow their own food in a natural way, I think the more resilience we're all going to have. And I think it starts with 
working with nature as much as possible. Very well said. I appreciate that. And the I, I learned it most at the school garden, but particularly in my garden now that when you've got the grasses and you've got the flowers and you've got the trees and you've got everything to attract the birds and the butterflies and the bees and the wasps mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. else that actually play a beneficial role in your garden, you don't have to put all of those synthetic chemicals in the garden. And I enjoyed your recent video where, where even using diatomaceous earth is one of those things that many of us avoid. I've got a big box of diatomaceous earth that it's like, oh, I'm cheating if I use that. But but you're really not. It's it's putting all the pieces together and you really can garden organically and have success. And you've demonstrated that on your channel. And I encourage everybody to check it out. It's a beginner's garden journey with Jill on YouTube. And I've got the link in the description below. By all means, check that out. You can go to Jill's channel and she's got links there for the podcast and all the other things that that you're doing. So Jill, thank you for joining us all today. And, and based on the comments, I can see people are gonna be checking you out and binge watching your videos. So thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you for inviting me. I love talking gardening and especially with someone like-minded. This has been a blast and your viewers are so kind. So thank you all for, for tuning in today. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you, Jill. And Maybe we'll see you again and get the opportunity to, to talk gardening. I hope you have a great gardening day. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So long. So for all of you, do check Jill's channel out. Click on the link in the description below. And as you know, I'll be back next Monday and we'll do this all over again. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for everything you do. Thanks for helping each other out, not only in this live stream, but along our entire gardening journey. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.